History tends towards eschatonic linear time, i.e. the end times, which has its origins in eternity. Eternity triumphs over finite time through apocalypse. If time is death, then eternity is life. Eternity and life is linked to the essence of freedom itself. The essence of history, therefore, is freedom. But what about finite freedom? This is determined in three terms. Theistic, transcendental terms via Kierkegaard, pantheistic, imminent terms via Hegel, and atheistic, materialistic terms via Marx. Only theistic, transcendental, and atheistic, materialistic terms are apocalyptic, since they are only complete when revelation occurs. Revelation is thus the subject of history, where we all burn before God's flame, the light of redemption and the aeon of sin. To Hegel, reality can be grasped through reason, acting counter to Kierkegaard. Through Marx, Hegel's idealistic exposition then turns basically into a crass materialism. Marx's atheism and Kierkegaard's theism share the same concept but from opposing perspectives. Each thus requires a leap of faith into the other. Freedom and the apocalypse result in a turning point. This turning point is not simply a change in social order, it is the apocalyptic end of an entire world so as to birth another. This requires a complete negation of the entire world, which keeps it distinct from the divine. God and the world are thus opposites. With such a world, God is unknown and non-existent, taken over to transcendence. However, it is this very God that can reduce the world to ruin. God puts the being of the world in question by contesting it in its entire validity. The unknown god of Gnostics thus acts as a slogan for nihilistic revolutionaries. The non-existent unknown god, like the nihilist who has never known god, smites all worldly sanctions through their power and presents a turning point. The apocalypse contains forming and form-destroying aspects that need to be in balance, very much akin to somewhat to Deleuze's concept of deterritorialization and reterritorialization, right? So to move uh, forward linearly, uh, the cyclic time of nature and the eternal return must be broken. Like the cycle of life and death, Eros is bound within nature's cycle. As such, it is the spirit that presses time forward in a linear fashion. The Geist Zeist of Joachim of Fiore and the Zeitgeist of Hegel all have their essence in history, whose essence, of course, is eschatological, paved along the path of creation and redemption. Now, memory is the foundation of history and thus is linked to eternity and the eschaton. Memory goes beyond mortality, you must remember. Memory, after all, can immortalize a man. Just as God constantly reminds the Jews how he led them out of Egypt, there is a link between memory, immortality, and God. God reveals freedom by abolishing all worldly dominion, authority, and power. Now, history, of course, we know is dialectic. It's a synthesis to Tabez between the thesis of God and the antithesis of creation or the natural world. The synthesis is when God and the world unionize for man for the sake of freedom. God, we must remember, though, is a stranger or an outsider. Abraham, too, was a foreigner in a foreign land, moving nomadically. Both act in opposition to the world as outsiders. Israel is also in exile, much like God. The Bedouin people similarly move in semi-nomadic tribes, just as the Jews wandered throughout the wilderness. Theocracy, likewise, frees man from human rule, dealing with the outside. The spirit of apocalypse is found in Gnostic systems. To Tabez, it was Oswald Spangler's concept of pseudomorphosis that showed how at the center of the apocalypse, Gnostic principles lay in the eschatological myth of the redeemed redeemer. Hey, remember too, pseudomorphosis is just the idea that um, an older generation's ideals are really so prevalent in society that it essentially uh, stagnates or retards the youth from like developing fully. So. The youth essentially adopt the practices of an older generation, um, which can kind of cause resentment because it, I mean, it literally prevents them from growing and developing. The older generation, of course, would be the Hellenistic viewpoint, um, and Gnosticism kind of developed out of that in the Aramaic um, fashion. 
as such, the, the, the Gnostic groups of Aramaic tradition wasn't really subject to um, Spanglish concept of pseudomorphosis. The Persians provide scaffolding for the apocalypse. The symbols of the Son of Man, Satan, the angels, the, the Book of God, uh, the divine host, judgment after death, and the judgment of the world are Persian versions of apocalyptic symbolism. Unfortunately, once the Persians became successors of the Assyrian and Babylonian tribes, they abandoned their anti-world uh, and ceased to be outsiders by settling down. The apocalyptic spiritual state transferred from this point to the persecuted Jews. Israel in exile mirrors the wanderings in the wilderness, not rooted in the land and living the nomadic life, again Delusian. Other Aramaic nations as well could not put down their roots. Thus, the apocalyptic seeds were planted in the whole Syrian Aramaic Orient. Now, the theme of self-alienation is the context of apocalypse. Alienness, or exile, or outsideness permeates apocalyptic and Gnostic literature the alien man and the unknown invisible alien god. The common ground of Plotinus, Neoplatonism, and the Mandians is that of God's alienation from the world and the resulting self-alienation experienced by mankind. The alien or outsider wanders nomadically without roots, having no home, a life of exile. In Gnostic writings and in St. Paul's, demonic powers rule this world and Satan is the prince of this world. The world is a demonic force, acting as God's antithesis, since he is outside. Thus we see light versus darkness, where darkness wins in this world since it is founded in darkness itself. We are thrown into the world in the Heideggerian sense, and being thrown into such a world is a powerful Gnostic symbol, since we were never given a choice if we wanted to live in an evil world or not, we're a soul trapped in a body against its will. The beyond calls to this soul trapped in a body from the outside. The Mandian, Manichaean, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions share a common apocalyptic call, as do Lovecraftians, I suppose, with the Cthulhuian call, the call of Cthulhu. The non-worldly comes into being through this call, something other emitted by the stranger or alien or exile who despises the evil rulers of this world. And so there is a newfound love for the stranger. The stranger emits the call, the redeemer who is redeemed. The events of history are when the stranger breaks through the generations and all separate worlds as an outsider. This is the apocalyptic course of history. This is the self-estrangement, the fall into exile in the path to redemption. Apocalypticism is the foundation which makes universal history possible. At the end, time hastens faster than before. There is an absence of any action. The fate of the world is predetermined, and there is no sense in resisting it. Marx's productive forces cannot seemingly be ceased. Since we humans inhabit an evil world, our humanity itself, as well as our evil and our evil world, will be wasted away, outside of our will to fight against it. The Gnostic coincidentia oppositorum, the coinciding of opposites, allows the invisible to be visible. It allows light to come from darkness. It allows spirit into body, as well as the spirit to be released during redemption. Hegel in Marx's dialectic is both dualistic and monistic, Gnostically inclined to reconcile thesis and antithesis through synthesis in the course of history. To Tabez, we must remember that the works of Hegel are not cyclic or circular, but work in the form of a spiral, bending backwards. The dialectic does not progress back to thesis in a circular manner, but broadens out into a spiral towards synthesis. Dialectical logic is the logic of history, anti-Aristotelian in scope, giving rise to eschatological interpretation of the world. We can go back to Plotinus and see how his hypostases are nothing but the steps leading to self-estrangement and return, i.e. an eschatological story of what we have become and what we will become. Gnostic mythology rages against its origins. Gnostics see Yahweh as the ruler of this evil world, and revolutionarily hatred erupts against this god and his principle. This is the admiration of the serpent, and even the notion about how Christ descended into hell to restore Cain and all those who rebelled against Yahweh.
This rebellious and revolutionary nature of Gnostics to Tabez aids us down the historical road of eschatology. The true Gnostic God is not just outside the world, but is against it, further expressing the revolution and the revolutionary pathos of the apocalyptic kind. The alien God releases the pneuma or soul of alienated man. Alienated man is freed by his alien God. This God's origin, of course, is Gnostic, and not from any Hellenistic ontology.